And I'd like to welcome Tibor Shanto to the program. I really appreciate you coming on, man. Oh, my pleasure. I've been looking forward to it. Yeah, so you are, I love, we actually had this conversation. I love your title, Chief Value Officer at Renbor Sales Solutions in Toronto. We actually connected through LinkedIn, uh, like many of us are connecting through LinkedIn lately. And uh, fellow Canadian, which I'm proud to have you on, um, your, your content, we were, we were talking about this earlier, your content has been not just tremendous out to the, um, to the social media world and LinkedIn world, but it's been really impactful for me as well. And uh, I really do appreciate you. I know you're busy, you're putting out tremendous amount of content every day, um, but to take the time to come on, I really, really do appreciate it. No, I enjoy it. I like talking sales. Yeah, so let's talk about yourself. Uh, give us a little bit of feedback. The history of your professional life, um, the success with Rembor Sales and Solutions, where you started. Uh, you know, give us a little bit of feedback on where you, sure. where, where you were and where you're going. I don't know where I'm going, so let's start with where I was. <laughs> um, I think like many people, I, I, I got into this not directly but sideways. And the brief story is back in the 80s, Somebody gave me a tip on a stock and I made a tremendous amount of money for that time over a week. And then they gave me another tip and I lost that much and more the following week. So oh. I figured there's got to be more to this than meets the eye and getting tips from Joey, you know. So I started looking into what it takes uh, to get the license here in Ontario from the Securities Commission. And one of the realities was that in order to take the program, you had to be sponsored by a registered firm. And the only position registered firms were offering novices and people who didn't have any sort of experience. And I was relatively new to the workforce to begin with. Um, so the only thing that they were offering was sales positions. So if I wanted to follow my ambition of making money in the stock market more often than losing, I had to take the position. And like many, for a while, I probably resisted, you know, thinking that I'll become the next, who knows, um, whoever was a big trader at the time. I was going to say Milken, but I don't want to go to jail. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so you resist the temptation because you want to be something else. But after finding myself in a successive series of sales jobs, you sort of realize, A, that it's not a bad job if you apply yourself to it. I think the people who don't enjoy it are the ones who are not applying themselves to it. And to apply yourself, you have to become a student of the craft. So I decided to become a student of the craft. Um, I was lucky that Dow Jones had always had a sales culture, whether, sorry, a, a training culture, whether it was good or bad, they had training every year and some of it was better than others. And what I began to realize is that there's more ways to do this than one. And then as things began to fall into place, um, you begin to evolve your own thinking and, you know, so on. And the way I got into what I'm doing now is around 2001. Um, I'd, I'd been director for Canada and for the American Midwest. Let's so think about a T across North America. And um, when uh, the downfall came, if you recall in 2000, we had the implosion of the dot com. In 2001, we had 9 11. And the big phrase in the market at that time was right sizing. And so, because we were a subscription business, every time somebody laid people off, called it right sizing that many of our subscriptions would disappear. So because Canada at the time had done better on a per capita basis than some of the other regions, and I was already had this title of director of sales strategy, they said, hey, that sounds a lot like training, take care of that for us. So at that time, I didn't know what I was doing, but they sent me to some programs that helped me understand how to put things together. I brought in the five top salespeople around the world for a week into Princeton and really we broke down the sale and I put together a program based on what was present in every region and at that time we called it tacit information transfer but as you know big corporations like to make acronyms real quick so mm -hmm. tacit information transfer wasn't going to work so we had to call it tacit knowledge transfer um, and so I rolled that program out and then I decided to move back to Canada for a host of reasons and somebody whispered in my ears just as I was crossing the border that maybe you should try this training thing on your own that you did for Dow Jones. So rather than seeking another sales job, I had started Renbor around 2004. Mm -hmm. um, my wife's name is Renee, so if people are wondering, Renee, Tibor, Renbor, you know. Yeah. Um, you know Makes sense. Simple marketing, yeah. <laughs> and um, 
I started by, and I still do, I work with B2B companies of all sorts. I think the primary characteristic would not be size or industry, but would be the fact that they're in mature industries, but want to grow at a higher rate than the industry. So if you will, the telcos, for instance, there's not going to be that many more new phones coming online. So the only place that Bell is going to get more subscribers is from Telus or Rogers. But how do you do that without resorting to price? Because you don't want to spiral to the bottom. So I have success with those companies that are looking for new business in the form of logos or, um, you know, going deeper and wider within the, uh, within the uh, existing accounts. And, and I would say that's probably why the Canadian Professional Sales Association accredited my prospecting program, because that's what I tend to focus on is how do you get in and have the right conversation? Candidly, I, I was a hunter by trade, so by the time it gets to questions of customer support, it all sounds very foreign to me. And I had to actually, that's the one muscle I had to develop once I started Rembor, because I knew how to get the business, I knew how to persevere, but I had to learn how to satisfy customers once they became customers. Yeah. So your focus is really, and we're going to go a little off script here, but your focus is really on the prospecting side of it. Do you stay within a particular channel or a particular... or? Um, industry or have you worked? No, no. As I say, I mean, you know, I've rolled out the prospecting program from Bell Mobility to Pitney Bowes to Imperial Oil, you know, so it's not dependent on that. As I say, I think the characteristic is that they want to win based on business and not on price. So, you know, my whole, the prospecting program is part of a suite that I call the objective based selling. So our focus or my focus with my customers is to focus on their customers longer term objectives with the understanding that there are going to be short-term things, maybe, you know, hurdles or accelerations or things like that along the way. But most businesses, even when they're experiencing short-term shocks like we are now during the outbreak, still maintain a longer-term focus because once this outbreak is over, we have another long cycle in front of us or whatever the case is. Yeah. So, yes, prospecting is where I get, you know, so I don't want to give the impression that I only do prospecting, but the challenge that many companies have, especially the traditional ones, you know, so if you look at the SaaS companies and all that, they're on a path, they think they have it figured out, history will tell, right? The numbers are beginning to give us a hint, but history will tell. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of companies, you know, up along the 400 and the 403 who are still selling the way that they sold five, six years ago and candidly based on their audience and based on their market, they don't need to change. But they still have the challenge of having the right conversation with the right person at the right time. And that's where I focus. So that starts with prospecting. But I go the rest of the cycle too. Okay, so let's talk prospecting. Again, a little off script because you hit on a good sure. point just earlier on a lot of companies doing the same thing that they have been doing for five years, 10 years, 20 years, however long. How is COVID now? with relation to prospecting and some of these organizations you've been working with, what are some of the changes you're seeing? Some of the, some of the pivots that have to be made to do better prospecting out there. I think you truly have to adopt this label of subject matter expert. I think that people are looking for ideas and that was before COVID and that's going to be that much more now, but they do see a salesperson coming. And, you know, as, as an example, whenever I'm asked, you know, what sales book an organization should read, you know, everybody expects that I would put mine first and a bunch of others and all that. And I would say buy them the 10 day MBA because they need to speak the language of a business person who's evaluating their business. Now, if you're a CFO in a middle, medium sized company and you created your budgets going into February, because we were what, about six weeks into the year before this thing hit, Mm -hmm. Some, some, some clients hadn't even handed out their quotas yet. So now you based all your budgets, forecasts, everything like that on sales coming in. Well, those sales are not coming in and it's nobody's fault, you know, but the virus, right? Yeah. So I think that if you're going to go in there and try and figure out how you can help them with a product or even a solution, the way that, that some people like to say, I think you're going to have a tough time because many of these people are trying to figure out how they're going to reshape their business. And that doesn't have to be wholesale change. It could just be adjustments like restaurants. They're now much more comfortable with curbside and things like that. Yeah. So yeah. that's the conversation you got to have, you know, like the stuff that I'm reading is, you know, stuff coming out of McKinsey and Boston group and all that as to what those guys are telling their clients to think, you know, two years from now. So 
to your question, I think the conversation has to be on an expertise level. That's not that I'm going to tell you what to do because I'm the expert, but I'm going to ask you the kind of questions that will make you think about what you should be doing now. And I will also offer up opinions. Um, so I think what I try and people laugh, but I think if you step back and think about it, I, I'm taking the, the style now that I'm confident enough my, in my abilities and I'm really trying to, the mindset, I don't say this to customers, but of course they're going to hear this now, but yeah. you know, the, <laughs> the mindset is that I'm trying to give them therapy. You know, yeah. I'm trying to yeah. get them to think about and talk about things that if somebody didn't prod them, they wouldn't because they don't want to deal with it or they don't know how to deal with it. But it's interesting that once you get them to put an issue on the table, there's almost this relief that that's out now, now I can deal with it. Whereas before they were using most of their energy to suppress it. Um, so I find that if you can go in there and, you know, the expression that I use and you see it all over my stuff is leave your product in the car, you know, leave the window open so it could breathe a little bit, but, you know, go in there with a blank canvas, a couple of brushes and some paint and see what you can paint up together. Yeah. And, you know, so I think that's more, so more true, more true than ever, especially now because of COVID. And I think the other is we have to be sensitive to what different people have gone through. Um, you know, we don't know, you know, I did a workshop on the 11th, uh, sorry, on the 9th of March, and it turned out two of the people subsequently came down with COVID. Well, for two weeks, I was freaking, right? So, yeah, no you know, and that, that, that period's over. So you don't know what people have dealt with. Un there's been unfortunate things. You know, I have a mother in a long-term care thing. I haven't seen her in coming on three months. Other people are dealing with this type of thing. So to come on like nothing's happened and I'm your best bud, I don't think it's going to work. But to come on like a lot of things have happened, let's try and figure it out together. Here are some of the things I'm thinking. And most importantly, here are some of the experiences that I'm bringing from others out there in the field. I'm a conduit to best practices out there, and that's the value I bring you. If you buy my product, great. But really, the value that I bring is being that conduit to the best practices that I see other customers doing. Sounds like it's the empathetic approach and we've seen a lot of content on that. So talk to me a little bit about relationships with your, with your clients, with your customers. Um, how important are they? And do you, do you focus on the, the building of relationships so you can have a long-term, uh, you know, a, a, I guess, outcome with these, with these particular customers, or is it always about new customer acquisition for you? What's the focus? So oddly enough, no. I mean, I think the thing that I pride myself on these days is the number of long-term clients that I've had. People who are one of two lanes. They're either using me constantly, and I've had a couple now for the last three years. It's been a constant evolution as, as their team evolves, you know, our engagement evolved with them. Or some other clients, more the regular thing is they bring me back every two, three years, even though not the entire sales team has turned over. Mm -hmm. Um the chance of getting freaky here and hear me out and then you can beat me up. Um, <laughs> I'm not a relationship guy. I'm, I'm generally, you know, in high school, I was the guy at the back wall waiting for a girl to ask him to dance. Or if I saw a girl that I liked, I would ask her to sit this one out because I was not a social guy. I was not a dancer or anything like that. So I'm not one of these gregarious salespeople. Yes, I have, you know, when I do my videos, there's a personality because I believe in this stuff and so on. But I hate networking events because I'm a shy guy, right? So I don't do well at networking events. I force myself to go because I know I have to, but it's a traumatizing experience for me, right? So I can't form relationships like that, but I do look at the long term and I figure that any relationship worth having is going to take longer than any given sales cycle, right? So, you know, I mean, again, we're talking real relationships and it doesn't have to be where I get invited to the kids bar mitzvah, but you know, somewhere between the two, right? So that's going to take a long time to evolve. I'm going to have to demonstrate some capability, demonstrate some trust, you know, get a little bit of credibility. Most people try and rush that process with a couple of, you know, light sort of social things, but they find out how light that is the next year when they lose the deal to somebody else. I had a woman that worked for me in Ottawa selling to the government and she got this department that was really hard to get. And I asked her how she got it. It was relationship, relationship, relationship. Next year, she lost it for, to a competitor for a 10% discount. And I asked her, what's your relationship worth? Because it's clearly not worth more than 10%, right? Yeah. So, you know, so I think that the word relationship gets abused in that way. But I think that if I deliver value, if I work to deliver exactly what I promised and more, 
and the customer agrees that I've delivered some difference for them, then there's going to be an ongoing dialogue that will ultimately be a relationship. But it's going to be based on me being able to deliver the expectations that I set out to do. And then as they get to know me, we become friendly, we become social. And now this guy that I've worked with for three years will pick up the phone and call each other. And some of my customers we speak to on the weekend, but they would tell you that it's because of what I bring to the company as opposed to what I bring to them as a person. Yeah. It's an interesting way of looking at it because most people always refer back to what a relationship in their mind is, which again, when you, when you position it that way, you lost a deal for 10% of the cost. There was no relationship there. There was no, no. Fund. there was nothing. There was nothing, you know, you know, for a brief time when I was with Factiva, when they did that, Dow Jones did that back and forth with, with Reuters and things. Um, for a brief time, I had this responsibility. I was the first one to have the Blackberry, and that was, and Blackberries were at that time just pagers, remember? Yep. Little ones, and they had, you know? And we were exploring on how, you know, how to, uh, how to put news on that sort of thing, and I completely lost my train of thought. Where were we on the really? Oh, yeah, so I used to work down at King & York, 145, and because I was involved in this project of trying to put news on WAP devices, if you remember, that was the big phrase around 99, 2000. Mm -hmm. I used to get all these kids, and I mean that sarcastically and specifically, um, who were launching their dot-com because it was still before the, the, the... And they came to my office, and what they wanted was nothing to do with me. What they wanted is our name in a press release, right? Yeah. So these kids come to me and say, you know, I want to partner with you. And this is my view of relationship. And I said, not a problem, dude. Project's a million two, write me a check for 600,000, you're my partner, right? <laughs> and all of a sudden, things disappeared. And I think that relationship is sometimes used like that. There's something in it for them. And I think most customers see through the gregarious, phony guy, and they're going to judge him on what they deliver. Yeah. And so I have a hard time with the grace, and I'm sure I've lost deal because people thought I was too stiff or too cerebral or whatever the case is. But so to me, relationships are important, but they're built on what I was able to bring to you as opposed to what I'm willing to say to you. Yeah. It's, um, I think it, it ties a lot into your title. And I want to go back to that because we've had this conversation about your title, Chief Value Officer. You don't see a lot of Chief Value Officers, but I think there's, based on this interview, it, it really it really ties into what you're about. So how did you come up with the, rather than CEO, COO, CTO, I mean, how'd you come up with CF, CVO? Yeah, it's, well, two things. One is this constant uh, search to be different. I mean, let's face it, you know, there's what, about 800 million of us on LinkedIn. You gotta do something, <laughs> right? So, you know, so one of the things you can play with is the titles, right? Yeah. On the other hand, I saw a lot of different things coming out. So a few years ago, I was fascinated by the trend of chief revenue officer because I thought it, it captured a different concept than just the sales officer. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you know, it all, one, of the, one of the exercises that I do when, when, I, when I do a workshop is I ask people to define value. Because if you think about it, almost every sales conversation has the word value. Mm -hmm. Yet no two people define it the same way. And all joking aside, you can ask five salespeople to define value and you'll have seven definitions because the first two will change their mind based on what the next three say. Yeah. And so if you can't define value internally, how are you going to define it to a customer, right? So we put a lot of emphasis on having an actionable definition of value, which is customers will see value in anything that helps them bridge gaps or overcome hurdles between them and their objectives. Mm -hmm. So that's how we define value. And I encourage my clients Tell your customers this is how you define value because if they agree with you and they should because it's about their objectives, then you've got a roadmap for moving the sale forward. It's a tactical thing. I mean, I'm not going to hide it, right? If I can get them to buy my definition of value, I'm going to have much greater influence on their thinking than the next guy who hasn't bothered getting them to agree to their definition of value. Yeah, so it always kept coming back to this value thing, right? And then I looked around and you always have chief sales officer, chief marketing officer, chief this. But the one thing that we all talk about doesn't seem to be in any of these titles. So I say, what the hell? You got to be first, right? <laughs> it works. I love it. I love it. So no. I want to give a little plug to you here because you've got uh, a great thing coming up uh, on LinkedIn, Breakfast of Champions. Talk a little bit about it, uh, where to come from, what's the premise, and uh, who's on it. So it came out of the COVID. And as you know, I've been doing these videos. And I think two or three times I've had guests on, people that I was talking to who said something interesting with respect to how we can deal with COVID. I said, why don't you come on this thing, right? And 
any way you slice it, forget political stance and all that, but it, it seems that we're now coming out of the bunkers, right? Different rates, different places, and you have to at one point, and I don't want to get political, but the reality is from a sales perspective, we're beginning to come back. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to do something on that to continue because you can't do the COVID thing forever. At one point, you got to turn direction and, and look forward, right? So that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to leave the COVID series behind, but have some means of continuing my rants or spiels or whatever you want to call them, right? And then I also had a parallel thought that, you know, I'm always asked to do these webinars. And it came because there's somebody was trying to schedule for me to do a webinar with them. And it's inevitably at two in the afternoon, which is okay for me because I look at webinars as lead generation. But I'm telling these salespeople to go out there and da, 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 da. Yet I'm telling them to sit in their chair at prime time. Yeah. Whereas the guys that I like to work with, you know, were full energy by 7.30. So that's when it sort of hit me that, you know, breakfast for champions, because the champion salespeople would be there. And then it sort of rolls from there. And so I'm thinking that if we have success with the first week, then I would try and make it something a bit more permanent. Probably not every day, because as we talked about in a different context, it becomes too demanding. Mm -hmm. But, you know, maybe once a week type thing or what have you. But the goal was to, and I specifically planned it for, you know, Memorial Day down in the States, that when they come back tomorrow, we hit them right away, Breakfast for Champions. So it helps them with their new attitude, helps with, you know, re-entering the, the, the realities. And I'm hoping some managers use it as a means of, creating focus so they can have some ways to motivate their salespeople. So we've got um, somebody who's like a rock star. I call him, you know, special chefs, you know, so he's cooking up something, John Moore on, uh, on enablement. Um, got Bob Apollo on the 27th. who's still going to talk about enterprise. Jeff Bajoric, who, you know, is going to talk prospecting and rethinking your sales cycle. And then we're going to be tying things up on Friday with, um, with Andrew Jenkins talking about LinkedIn. And from what I understand, all these will make their way to YouTube. So um, I'll let you know how people can uh, catch up if they didn't catch it first thing in the morning. But one way to prove to your manager, your champ is to show up for my thing at 7.30. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and yeah, and when this, uh, when this airs, it would be past that. But uh, what's next for you? Because what I'm gonna do is ensure that in the show notes when we do launch this uh, is, is whatever's coming next for you. So one thing that I'm doing, and I think, you know, I'll be ready to pull the, the, the curtain off it to some degree, probably by mid-month. So we're talking here last week of May, so mid-June. Uh, and I'm doing this thing called the Proactive Prospecting Dot Club. So if they go to Proactive Prospecting Dot Club, it's basically not a membership site because membership sites, you know, tend to have a certain flavor or formula. So sorry. Um, so it's basically, it's got a lot of my content. It's got a lot of different tools and things, but it's an area where people can go if their job is prospecting in B2B and you need resources, you need ideas, you need different things and so on. And it is going to be like a club. So you're going to join, you're going to have access to different things. There's always fresh content. So if they like the stuff that they saw during COVID, they'll be, you know, weekly in office. So I'll be sitting on a Zoom like this where people can come and talk prospecting. There'll be webinars. Mm -hmm. So there'll be a lot of, but it's all geared to prospecting and there'll be courses. There'll be other things. If you if your audience wants to sort of understand, you know, if you go to regular membership sites and you've got courses, I look at it as being a deluxe box set. You get a lot of extras, you get a lot of nice things, but how many times have you watched that box set on your shelf a second time? Yeah. Whereas I want to yeah. provide a streaming service, always fresh content, things dealing with prospecting, create, you know, conversations among prospectors, but nothing, you know, the way I thought about it is if you have to, you know, if you have a rough day at the office and you want to go to a club where people understand you and have a drink, you know, like James Bond went to the Blades Club. <laughs> yep. I'm doing that for prospectors. <laughs> I'll keep you posted on it. Yeah, uh, please do, because it sounds good. I mean, it sounds like I can have like a scotch and a cigar and actually uh, sit at home and, go, and and be a part of the club. So it works great. Thinking certificates for scotch, you know. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. I always finish up, Tibor, with uh, with three rapid sure. fire questions. And uh, the first one's going to have to change, I guess, in a few weeks. But what's the first thing you're going to do when you get out of isolation? You know, the thing I miss the most is just having a cappuccino at the side of the road and watching people go by. Yeah. So I'm going to find some cafe on Young Street. I know a couple that I have in mind and I'm just going to go park myself and just have a couple of coffees and just watch people walk by that I haven't been able to see in years, you know, not years, but months. It just seems I hear like you. it feels like years. 
I know. Yeah. Uh, if somebody were to write a book about you, what would they title it? At least he tried. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> That's beauty. I love it. I thought about that, you know, like, <laughs> at least he tried. <laughs> if you could give yourself, knowing what you know now, knowing everything you know, um, what, would you, what advice would you give your 20-year-old self? To take it seriously more early or to take it seriously earlier in the career. Um, you know, so I'll be, you know, the first couple of years, am I in this? Am I not in this? Okay. But once you decide you're in this, right? Because again, I know that sales is enticing and people will come into it to pay off their student loans and things like that. But once you decide this is what you're going to do, then get into it early. Don't be like a lot of guys that I train where they haven't advanced in 20 years other than, you know, the latest fashion and things like that. So commit early because the earlier you commit, the better you'll be. And not only will you make more money, but you'll have more relationships. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I, uh, I know you're busy and I really do. You got a lot on the go, but I really do appreciate you coming on and um, much appreciated. I wish you the best of luck and we're definitely going to stay in touch. I'm sure. Definitely. I had lots of fun. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thanks, Tibor.